Hi, and welcome back to the Employer Content Marketing Pod. This is part two of a conversation around future content trends. I'm chatting with Nick Francis, and Nick is co-founder of Casual. Casual are expert filmmakers and are very well placed to be talking about future content trends. In the previous episode, we were talking about the challenges that organizations face and how they need to adapt and look to the future now to keep ahead of the head of the market and be in a really powerful position when economies pick up again. In this episode in particular, what we're doing is talking about specific examples attached to these future content trends. So you get a real feel about what brands are doing to address these challenges. So let's get on with the chat. Yeah, what, what's out there you think that's like really kind of ticking the box? Yeah, so I think, <laughs> The most significant example of this, and some of the audience might be uh, aware of, of him, but um, you know, if, if you think about the most dangerous potential competitor to McDonald's currently, um, you wouldn't necessarily think it was a 24 year old from the Midwest of the US, but uh, there's a guy with a following of over hundred million on YouTube called Mr. Beast. And so Mr. Beast has, has built up this incredible following by producing all these videos that people love. He did a sort of reenactment of Squid Game, like a real life reenactment of Squid Game, which I think is one of his most successful. He's done all sorts of content. It's just, it's very, very watchable. The guy is a genius. He's got a number of different channels. Um, and what he's done is by creating all this content, he's built an incredible amount of brand equity, right? So Mr. Beast as a, as a brand, has now has the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to go and do this. And he can just leverage. And we see this with, with influencers as well. Like they build brand equity by building trust with their clients, with their, um, with their followers. And then they can sort of, that sort of gives them like an almost kind of superhuman power to be able to go, oh, we, I'm just going to do this. So Mr. Beast has created Mr. Beast Burger. Um, and Mr. Beast Burger is a virtual burger concept. He's got a number of, you know, several thousand ghost kitchens across the US and in, and in Europe. Um, and they produce his burgers to his specifications. And it's just it's literally just leveraging his brand. So he's like, I'm just going to do that. So he would had the opening of his first ever bricks and mortar store in New Jersey earlier this year. Um, and it was the most successful opening in the history of hospitality. They had over 10,000 people queuing around the block um, just to get one of his burgers on the opening day. You know, and that is that is the power of content. And so, you know, that is where like those people, they 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 they're like, oh, I, you know, I want a Mr. Beast burger, because, and it's because of this huge brand equity. And I appreciate, you know, if you're working in a in a bank or a business services firm, it's like, well, okay, well, how is that relevant to me? Well, the, the point is that it's like we we all as communicators have the ability to build levels of brand equity. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you're going to get 100 million followers on YouTube. I'm not suggesting you need to get 100 million followers on YouTube because the, the fantastic thing about the online environment is that you can find your niche audience, right? And maybe maybe you only need a thousand people, right? And, and that can be enough. But if you're, if you're creating content that they love, that they will, you know, they, they will um, tune out of Netflix for to come and find your content, that like, you you are winning and you're building huge amounts of brand equity that then you can start to use and leverage. Um, and that is, I think that's, you know, this, this, the brands that appreciate this are the ones that are really going to succeed in, in over the next five to 10 years. And the ones that don't will really suffer. And that's because I think traditional advertising, you know, it's no, no news that traditional advertising as a medium is, is, is suffering. Uh, I know that Netflix um, and some of the streaming platforms are looking at how they can bring advertising into the platform. But, you know, if you think about your sort of your ABC one target demographic, who are like the key demographic for advertisers to be reaching, they don't watch commercials anymore. Right. So it's like, okay, well, how as a business do I communicate with them? And it's like, well, you have to be creating content that is so good that they're like, that they will seek it out. And so, you know, so, I mean, to talk about Netflix, you know, they, um, up until about 2019, Formula One was really struggling to, um, to, to, to get traction in the US. Um, you know, it was seen, it had a bit of a kind of, it was a bit of a wonky uh, brand. It was like, it was kind of dull, you know, just cars like driving around and around in circles. It was all very noisy. 
kind of like, you know, men go and watch it on a Sunday afternoon in a woolly sweater. Um, and then in 2019, Netflix brought out Drive to Survive. And what Drive to Survive did was it brought to life all the different teams, all the drivers, all the uh, all of the, comp- uh, the, 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 the drama of the platform. And it made it made it really tangible for people, so they could see they knew who the drivers were, they knew what they were trying to do, they knew some of their backstory, um, and it it has just completely transformed uh, the, the 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 franchise. So uh, the having really struggled to break break into the U.S. market, the uh, U.S. Grand Prix this year in Austin, they had four hundred thousand people there. That's the largest Grand Prix in history, and it was in Austin. And this, you know, that would have been completely unheard. It would have been unimaginable in 2018. And so the franchise value has gone from about $8 billion back in 2018, 19 to about 14 billion now. So it's nearly doubled in value in three years, right? And that's purely down to the effect of Drive to Survive. I think it's in its third or fourth series now. And, um, and that is content. That is the power of content. And so what they've done there is they're like, they, you know, you find the stories, like there are great stories in every business. Every organization has amazing stories that are associated with its purpose and what you're trying to achieve. And if you can, if you can find those stories and then tell them compellingly, then that's, that, that is the focus. And that's how you build that brand equity. Um, and yeah, as I said, like, we are moving into a, a time where people, where the businesses that get this will succeed and the ones that don't will really struggle. Absolutely, and you. There's. I'll drop in uh, in the episode description um, an example of the work you've been doing with. Um, we haven't got time to talk about it now in detail, but stuff you've been doing with the NBA. You know, I've, I've seen seen a lot of that, and that's just lovely, absolutely beautiful stuff. And I think you think about you know think about what Mr. Beast is doing, and you know think about what Joe Wicks in the UK. You know, is the same. Kylie Jenner is always about these people are absolutely plugged into knowing what their audience wants. And you know, I've said this before on the podcast, but it's you know, people in you know marketing. You know, they talk about knowing the audience, but this is about fundamental. YouTubers know their audience fundamentally. Know exactly what you know what what they what they want. So when you that's why that's why Mr. Beast is so successful because he's really thinking about what's you know. He's on the pulse, basically. What what I like, I mean, just on that point, what what what's amazing about what's happened with with video production over the last, you know, 10, 15 years is that you know, like the reason those YouTubers, influencers, Instagrammers, the reason quite often that they understand their audience is that they are their audience. And so they, you know, they create content that just completely resonates for their audience because they know. They know implicitly what they're going to respond to because, you know, more often than not, they are one of the target audience. And that, you know, that wasn't, that hasn't always been the case, you know? And so if you look at sort of traditional TV, like it was quite often, it was, you know, they were made, they were sort of trying to judge what an audience would respond to. Right. And so, and so they make content, something's hit, something didn't. Whereas what, what the sort of the democratization of content production has allowed is that all these people can just make contents for themselves, for them, for their friends. And it's just like, it's absolutely on point. And I think that's, that's what explains the success of, you know, all of those influences you, you talk about, you know, you look at, you, know, you yeah, you look at Mr. Beast and, you know, I didn't want to keep focusing on him because I think, you know, there's, there's, there's a thousand other, um, uh, examples, but you know he's he's there with his friends, and they they just make great content that makes them laugh that they love, you know. And so it's like it's perfect. He's got like he's literally making the content with the focus group, um, and that you know that that's that's a new thing. And it, you know it's I mean it's not it's not it's not particularly new right now, but like you know that's certainly an evolution over the last couple of decades. And there's the immediacy as well. Literally, you know, he amongst in, an insert. Lots of other YouTube, lots of other great content creators. They know exactly when a piece of content flies and when it doesn't fly so much. You know, they, mm. they know exactly what works and what you know what doesn't. And they, so they are constantly, you know, well optimizing without probably saying optimizing. <laughs> they are. They're just going. Well, no, it didn't work. 
or that no, that didn't work. People dropped no. at that point of you know the video actually so, and I said that so therefore you know I need to change it. That is like properly plugged into into the communities that you're serving, which is fantastic. I think you're com completely right. That I mean that's one of the benefits of you know this sort of like really high cadence, so sort of getting lots of content out um, and then being able to iterate on it because they can see like really rapidly. It's like, you know, okay, well that show really worked because, you know, it was, it was about, I think it was about giving away money or that show really works. It was about blowing something up or, you know, that didn't work because people aren't really interested in animals on this channel or whatever, you know, and so they can just iterate. And so they're constantly improving. And that's like, you know, that's what people talk about with the TikTok algorithm is like, they get, just get like a, such a plethora of data points on, on just, the way people, what they pause on, how much they watch, what they um, go back to, that they can then just like continually hone and hone and hone the algorithm so that they know exactly what con piece of content is going to make you stay on the platform for longer. Um, and so, yeah, whether whether it's whether it's the algorithm on the platform or just the producers. Funny enough, I watched, a, there was a YouTube short with Mr. Beast the other day and he was being asked, you know, can you explain the YouTube algorithm? And he sort of, to paraphrase it's like it's really simple it's about it's about like how many people are watching your content and how far through do they get watch it so it's like so basically if you want to if you want to produce the uh the youtube algorithm it's a make great content and make sure that it's properly labeled and it's like and it's that simple you know it's not it's not rocket science but it just it, it has to be good but he's like, he's a good example of how yeah. how you don't have to have a big team you know it's like he's he doesn't. He won't have a massive crew. You know, he's not. It's, he's. It's not about him being a personality. It's about the quality of his content, which just makes it. Which makes his platform really, really scalable. So, what about if we're looking looking further into the future? You know, what is that trend? That's. I mean, people are working on it now, but it's on, on the horizon. Well, I, I think one of the most significant trends when we look at production and community and. and, and uh, commute this interplay of the tools uh, and creative, like you know, I think the virtualization of the production process, you know, whether that's like AI generated tools, so like um, you know, you can get like an AI generated pr presenter now. Um, so you just type in your script, and it and it'll present for you. It still is quite creepy and a bit weird, um, but you know, it's very early generation technology, and so you know that kind of like. The AI uh, video generation. There's obviously uh, uh, image generation, like still image generation tools like DALI 2. So you can do, um, you type in whatever you want. So uh, I've got an example where it's, uh, it's two teddy bears in two mad scientist teddy bears experimenting with sparkling chemicals in a steampunk style. Uh, it's, 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 it's a, it's an absolute bizarre image, but you know what the what the uh, platform does, or the, the algorithm does, is it it, can, it it takes what you've written and then continue and reruns thousands and thousands, millions, billions of re-renders until it the, the image that it comes up with looks like what you've typed, and so it it's looking for a kind of pattern recognition, which is just like it's absolutely mind blowing to think that, that happens. So there's those tools which are sort of you know generation which can you know. So, for instance, you could do uh, uh, like uh, still image generation, which is like so. If you have to create a a catalog, so we did we did some work with Tesco Home a few years ago, and we would we had to film every permutation of this like uh, of a bedroom, and you know we'd swap in lights because you know so we could see what the different lights looked like, what the different throws on the bed, what the cushions on the bed might look like. And it was like it was an insanely laborious process, whereas now they can just do a photorealistic image and just and just switch it. So it's like, oh, you want you want an orange bread spread, you want a red bed spread, you want a you know you want this light by the bed, that light by the bed. They can do like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of permutations, like, and all it is is render time. And so you know, like there, it's like those kind of tools which are really going to start to impact our industry more, but they're like. They really are just tools. And so, you know, I'd say before we, we put a lot of work into understanding, like, what's the intersection between 
those capabilities and 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 and, and tools and what we can do as a, and, and what producers and communicators can do and we think like human beings like remain a fairly core part of the production process certainly within the time frames that we're looking at because but, but but what the tools enable us to do is to make those humans more efficient so they can spend more time on the things where they're really able to add value so whether that's sort of thinking creatively or just face time with clients to understand it, or just going out and looking for those stories you know researching people who can contribute you know so like you, you take out a lot of the um the, the repetitive work that maybe made it made up a really significant part of the job in the past um, and allow them to focus on the things that make them uniquely human and, and make them sort of excellent within the process so it's not about removing the human it's about it's about you know like, as with any tool it's about making them more efficient so that's so that's that's a key thing i think another part of the virtualization of production is just you know the ability with um motion tracking and, and, and cameras you can use uh we can now project backgrounds that look that look realistic and so instead of having to fly cars or people all over the world in order to get a location you can now just project the location and to the viewer it looks perfectly real and so that has a really significant downward pressure on on cost but then also complexity on carbon uh, and, and environmental impact of uh, of productions and it just makes doing things you know if you need to do a pickup or something it's a lot easier if you need to you know shoot different options it's easier uh, and so you know that's really significant and then beyond that to just immersive media so whether it's it's the metaverse um and and the role of content within that um or just using some of the new tools like uh, vr ar uh, 360 video interactive video you know, they're all, you know, as I said, with the, um, with the image generation, they're all just tools which we can use as, 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 uh, as communicators, as storytellers to tell more compelling and, and interesting narratives for our audience. Okay, so let, let's now have a think about um, the people who are listening and they're going into that next meeting or they've got a big meeting coming up in terms of looking at the future, looking at a six-month plan, 12-month plan, however long their kind of future thinking is, like, what should they really be bringing to that meeting in terms of things that they should be doing? Guys, this is what we should, you know, we should be doing doing next. The first thing is a, a really clear idea of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, be very, very specific about what you're trying to achieve with any project. Uh, you know, don't try and include too much messaging. Just don't try, don't feel like you can kind of work your way through a project and then try, start to focus it. But, because the more clear you can be at the outset, the better you can understand who your audience are and how you need to communicate to them. That brings us on to the audience. It's really important to understand exactly who your audience are and equally importantly, what makes them tick. So maybe take some time, look on YouTube, uh, go on Instagram, look at try to understand a bit about how is your target demographic? Uh, what is the, the, the filmic grammar or the content grammar that they're, in, that they're engaging with online? Um, how can you like, just understand what the baseline is for content that really engages that target group? Um, and then have set really clear goals and test and measure against those goals. So the, fantastic thing about creating content online is it allows you to continually iterate as we talked about earlier so you can you put con put films out but you know try a few different ideas see what resonates and then really double down on those and just continually iterate um then you need to be prepared to have a uh, a relatively longer term uh, uh horizon on this so you know six months is, is not going to cut it in terms of being able to return a really, it's not going to be able to return the kind of returns that you can get from one of these sort of longer term brand affinity building projects. If you just want to create some demand gen generation, of course, you know, it's a slightly different, slightly different beast and you, you know, and you can get a far faster return on that, but the really long term benefits that you can see from content production, are, they compound over time. And so you really have to start to build up um, the affinity when that can be a, a, a 9, 18, 
24 plus month process. Now, that's not to say that you can't, in setting up your goals for the project, you will be able to show that it is being effective, but you're not going to be able to get, you know, so, you, you know, you'll have something to take to, to the CFO or whoever is holding the, the purse strings. Um, but, you know, you're not going to see the really beneficial compounding returns in, within that time frame. And then I think beyond that, the sort of just to finish off, I think is the the real need to take a level of risks. I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg said the biggest risk is not taking any risks. And he was absolutely right because there's so much noise. We talked about content proliferation. We talked about, you know, 165 million people joining the uh, creative economy over the last two years. We talked about algorithms that serve your, 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 your audience like the most perfect content that will keep them engaged for a long period of time. And so if you're not willing to really, really push it and create stuff that's going to make a wave and really get and, and, and win attention from your audience, then you may as well just save your money. Absolutely. Um, and Zuckerberg is, you know, is um, definitely doing something at the moment and lots of quarters are saying, He's wasting his money. He's Mark really Zuckerberg's t- definitely taking some risks at the moment. <laughs> he is, you know, but but he's, you know, he's <laughs> yeah. he's living true to what he's, you know, done a lot over, over the years. Whatever criticisms there may be of him, you know, he's he is not resting on the company's laurels at all, you know, and um, you know, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens. But yeah, you're right. yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I I think that that thing about iteration is really important, isn't it? Because those meetings that one can have, you know, is like, you know, especially with kind of decision makers, it's, it's, well, this needs to work, you know, well, actually, you know, the bigger the budget, it's kind of without any kind of iteration to start with, <laughs> the bigger the pressure for something to work, but that iteration is really mm. important to then grow it into something that the, the team or the business is more confident that something will work. Um, and that ties into kind of sitting alongside that proliferation of content that's out there is that um you know if you put if you put all your budget on um if you put all your budget on a on a 500 plus grand you know campaign then which is just a very limited number of assets it's a big risk but if you do it a different mm-hmm. way it's it's not so much is it but then that's down to how you frame it how you frame frame everything Completely. But you know, like, we, we can test in a way that you just couldn't test in, you know, in traditional kind of broadcast advertising. You know, like, there was there was there was a sort of a level of of budget that you had to hit in order, you know, you had to pay to play. And, and, you know, and we're talking about a level which where you just couldn't really iterate on that. You know, you wouldn't get enough data points. Whereas now, you know, you can just just put it out like you could, you, you know, you, you probably have a, a small sector of your target audience that you can test content with, you know, yeah. do like if you've got, a, I don't know, 50k, 100k budget, you know, maybe just try just, you know, spend 10% of that on just creating something small, just to see what, see, see what they respond to, you know, yeah. and then and iterate. Exactly. Um, and that, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's how you get the answers. Exactly. It's like minimum kind of minimum viable concept type approach, minimum viable product type approach of just yeah. kicking it out there. And you're going to get data that's so much more valuable than than just, you know, sticking it in internal focus groups or, or panels. It's just not enough to really yeah. understand whether something would work or not. Yeah. Good times for sure. I, I just I think this is such an exciting time to be working in this space, you know, as I said, like, yes, there is, there are, there are risks, there are kind of big, um, macro trends that potentially will impact the world that we're working in. But like from a content production standpoint and from as, as, as business communicators, whether we're working in recruitment or internal engagement or marketing or advertising or training, like the tools at our fingertips are more powerful than they've ever been. And so I think it, it's 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 we hold, it's incumbent on us to use those tools to tell really compelling stories around the businesses that we're working with, um, and um, and yeah, that's a that's it's an, it's an exciting opportunity despite all of the backdrop 
um, that, that we face. Absolutely. Well, it's been a, yeah, as always, Nick, it's been a great chat. Um, before we leave, we've got... Um, yeah, it's great to talk to you, Chris. Uh, definitely. It's, um, and there's, there's going to be a bit more for, um, for listeners if, if they're interested, isn't there? So um, yeah. you guys have got a, a bit of a workshop planned um, to kind of continue these themes. Um, tell us a little bit. That's little right. Bit about that. Yeah. So, of course, yeah. So, you know, obviously we've, we've, we've talked about some of the trends and some of the risks and some of the opportunities, um, but we really wanted to try and make it as uh, as tangible for people and as, as, as to hate a term I, I hate, but it kind of sort of works here, actionable for your audience as possible. And so anyone who's interested in uh, taking some of these trends that we've discussed and, and, and working out like actually, you know, how can we start to put those into process? How can we be creating um, a strategy, but then also following through with it? We're going to be running a workshop uh, for anyone who wants to sign up. It's completely free. And it really is about helping them um, to make a success of this. Um, you know, we're not as uh, not looking to sell anything. Uh, we just want to want to help people. Yeah, I mean, you guys know, you know, have so much experience and you know, that knowledge, and you know, it's, it's it's good it's good to share it for sure. And that's that's ultimately what this you know this this podcast is about as well. So um, yeah, really appreciate you uh, you you doing that. And um, yeah, well. Enjoy the rest of your sure. enjoy the rest of your day. It feels like it's Friday. It feels like it should be have a good weekend, but <laughs> it's been it a long feel week. like Friday. I... <laughs> well, thanks very much, Nick. And uh, uh, we'll see yeah, you later. no, no, absolute pleasure. And you know, anytime. And you know, if anyone has any questions or want to continue the conversation, please uh, find me on LinkedIn. Um, just Nick Francis film, um, and uh, yeah, it'd be great to continue the conversation on there.